The whole experience being out there, like waking up before the sun comes up, getting yourself on a ridge, you just become so much more inquisitive about nature and ecosystems and animals and how they move and what they're thinking. And I just, I felt like so much more connected with the land. I guess I, I'm kind of awestruck by, you know, if you've heard an elk bugle. And it just, it gives you shivers and goosebumps. And if you can actually call back and bring that elk in, it hands down one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. It's taking a life, which doesn't sound spiritual, but you know, this is what our ancestors did. It's primal and very instinctual. And until I think you've done it, it's really hard to put into words what the experience is actually like. But it's very powerful. Beneath every person, there's a reason for why they do what they do. Join Outdoor Idaho as we find out what it takes to be a hunter. Funding for Outdoor Idaho is made possible by the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho, by the Friends of Idaho Public Television, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Idaho is home to more than 50 million acres of public land. That's virtually 70% of the state. And for centuries, people have been hunting on this land, the Nez Perce, the Shoshone, the Bannock, the Paiutes, the Coeur d'Alene's. And occasionally, it was both men and women who did the hunting. Hi, I'm Bruce Reichard, and welcome to Outdoor Idaho. You know, today, nearly 300,000 Idahoans hunt. And lest we men forget, putting fresh meat on the table is not a gender-specific activity. All it takes is a good eye, a steady hand, and a desire to get out on the public's land. Now, every hunter has her own story. So let's hear some of those stories firsthand from the women who hunt. I started hunting five years ago. Growing up in Idaho, it's always been present in my life, but I've never actually pursued it myself. I decided to try it. Oh yeah, it's exciting. You know, you're hiking up in the dark, peeking around every little ridge, making sure you're seeing everything. It's a beautiful morning, couldn't ask for a better hunt. Oh, you're going to be a hunting star today. <laughs> yeah. Well, the boat is part of the adventure. I grew up with three brothers, so I did hunt a little bit with them. Uh, one quail hunt, a couple of duck hunts with my brother Pat. And I cried the first time I shot a duck, too. <laughs> All right, Trudy, you're about ready. I am the dog captain, and that entails managing the scheduling of all the dog handlers and making sure all the dogs are up to snuff for the season and properly trained. Whoa. Good. Whoa. If I'm hunting for myself, then it's heaven. It's, it's so peaceful and it's tranquil and you're just there and it's just you and your dogs and they're pouring out their heart for you and it's just almost like a church. I was 10 and I shot my first limit of grouse and I remember 
feeding everybody in the house with like my grouse. Like that was, that was a moment of pure pride. And then I went on to shoot deer and elk. Getting meat does matter. So I don't want to discredit like, oh, it's just so much fun to be out here. No, I'm, I'm out here intentionally with the intention of harvesting an animal. But if you focus too much on like the outcome, you don't really get to enjoy the beauty of the hunt. I'm feeling sexy. Okay, we got that big guy. So you can just make that steaks. I took Hunter's Ed when I was 12 and had every opportunity to learn how to hunt when I grew up from my dad who tried to get me involved, but um, I don't know, I could, I could have cared less. A couple years ago, I met a group of female hunters and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I thought, why am I not doing this? I should get involved in this. I wish I found it sooner, but I do feel like this is a sport that I was meant to do and meant to keep doing forever. We do have respect for life and we do take it as a heavy, heavy thing. It's not like you just wanna go out and kill everything you see, it's heavy, taking a life. But we do understand that it does contribute to the conservation of these animals. I mean, we love seeing the animals. Um, we just want to eat one or two of them a year. <laughs> well, women became involved in the conservation movement shortly after the Civil War ended in 1865. Women in the West were campaigning for conservation efforts, also through writing and their artwork, uh, but they were also hunting. They were hunting for sport, as well as to support their families. And then as time goes on, you get that, those white upper class women who have the leisure time and then they're coming into the West and they're doing more of that sport hunting. Working towards not only preserving certain landscapes, but also working to uh, preserve and educate the public about the wildlife of the West. It's not about the harvest, it's about pushing your limits and facing your fears and just being outside. And I always say, it's amazing where one little piece of paper, one little piece of paper that says you can go out and kill this animal, where that will take you. This is a hunt we do a lot, where we actually go back first and then come back around. We find sports or activities that make us live in the moment. So I think that's another thing, is when you're out there and you're waiting for the birds to flush, then you're living right in the moment. You're not thinking about yesterday or tomorrow. That gets me, keeps me going. and I can't even put it into words, but there's something about when you're, it's just you and your dogs on the side of a hill or out in the wide open prairie. It's like breathing, I don't know. It's that exhale after taking a deep breath. That's what I love about bird hunting. Good girls, good girls. So you can be in the mountains, you can be in the desert, you can be in the snow. You're outside in the elements and you're focusing on accomplishing a goal. That's what I love about it. But once you see something, it's like, is this the one? <laughs> it's instant adrenaline rush and it gets so exciting. And then you have to like, okay, you know, what am I seeing? And then calm yourself down. And then if it's a legal buck, then it's like, 
oh my gosh, it's a legal buck and your adrenaline spins again. Um, lots of deep breaths. So it's, it's an emotional day. So they'll get up and feed at night, go down to water, and now they're working their way, they're feeding their way back into the timber. This time of year with more snow on the ground, they'll tend to be out a little longer. So hopefully we get a good one here while we have this little open spot where we know we have an elk. The women who picked up um, hunting and other outdoor activities were sort of viewed as a little novel and eccentric. <laughs> and you see even in the captions of these very impeccably dressed women hunters, there's a lot of emphasis on their gender, like father with daughters or so-and-so huntress. Uh, they really did emphasize that novel part of women hunting. Well, one of the things I was thinking about when we were filming this is, you know, I got my nails done for a friend's wedding. And I was just like, oh great, they're gonna shoot me hunting and my nails are done. And now I'm gonna be one of those girls who gets all dressed up to go hunting. It shouldn't matter what I wear or what I look like, but it runs through my mind anyways. These are irrelevant. Yet, there's a reason someone can choose to invalidate me as a hunter. I've had experiences where I've been told I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna work because I was a woman, and I never would. Okay. Yep. I mean, it's certainly been hard, but it's certainly worth it. I think I'm at a point now, I mean, I'm near 40, and I'm, I don't care anymore. And so I'm gonna do what I wanna do because I love to do it. And that can either intimidate some people or not, and we just roll with it. Good girl. Good girl, thank you. Yeah, it was a little frustrating because I actually worked with a, a lot of hunters. And so I would hear about all of these successful hunts and men bonding and men going on, on hunt camps together. Um, and I, there was a little bit of jealousy because I wanted to so bad and, and I really wanted to learn. I'm just checking the range so I know my which pin to use. I have uh, two or three Mastering Elk Calls DVDs. I would just play these DVDs and yeah, it was, uh, it, I did a whole lot of learning on my own. The, these early women really created a foundation for women hunters today. You know, they proved the, their medal that women are able to do all the things that a man does. These early women really showed the contributions that women could make and, and sort of normalize the practice so that women participating today aren't viewed as eccentric or novel, that they're a part of this field. See the tallest tree in the middle? She's too You get one dog and you love it and it's great and you get two because two work better than one and then you get three so then you can rest and uh, then you get four so you can rest the two and, and then work the other two and you just keep snowballing. Well, maybe a whole other team of four would be great and then you get eight. Happy to see you, Peyton. 
And then you get some spaniels. And you gotta have a double team of spaniels too, so it just kinda snowballed into where I am now. But the versatility and the ability to do all of this, I need, I need the dogs and they, uh, they love what they do. Thank you. Sky. And uh, you felt pretty good about it? Uh huh. Yes. I had a little boy and um, I want to be able to teach him hunting because his dad doesn't hunt and I knew that one day he's going to be of age and I wanted to be able to take him hunting just like my dad took me. So if I didn't know how to do it and I wasn't proficient on my own then I wouldn't feel comfortable taking my son out because I wanted to be a good instructor to my kids. I definitely consider hunting for me and this elk for me very much a community situation. Like I wouldn't have been able to do this without the people that have been supporting me from day one. Give her a chunk of meat and let her go. I've been lifted up and supported since the moment I decided to hunt and I just, I just can't see it any other way. And I want to share it all with everybody except the backstrap. Not the back strap. <laughs> oh, one more time! <laughs> we had a holiday potluck one year at work and a woman from Ethiopia brought Ethiopian food. And a man from Italy brought Italian soup. And I, as a hunter in Idaho, got to bring elk meat. And we had pulled elk sandwiches. And to give that to people like in my own state, city, and from around the world, the opportunity to eat something that's so wild and free was just like so cool, so cool. Nice shot, John. That's a nice fat one. And the fact that it's organic and that you know where it's been before you put it in your freezer, which you can't always say about some of the protein that you buy in the store. We make really good stews. We can just do it with mushrooms and... Onions and mushroom and butter and oh my gosh. It makes all that heart pounding, leg throbbing. This is worth, <laughs> worth it, it yeah. for one second. <laughs> When it's time to take that shot, you kind of go into that like meditative, super grounding, grounded mode. Just whew, kind of everything else goes away. I think hunting should not be taken lightly. It is so dangerous. You're driving out to wild places. You're shooting a gun or really sharp arrows. You're putting yourself into the wild, away from your safety net of a vehicle. And then you gotta pack this animal back to your car and store it safely and then cut it up and then be safe with the meat once you get it. It's so dangerous. It's so hard. And yet, we do it. <laughs> you're hunting, you're not shooting. And my, my philosophy that I learned a long time ago when I was young was that um, most predators take nine to 10 times to actually get a prey so you have to keep that in mind when you're hunting you might have to go 10 times or you might get out the first day and uh, get your deer
that elk and I think I made a really good shot but we we watched her run behind some trees and we lost visual but I can't find her so now we're gonna give her some time and then we'll make our way around this bowl to that ridge and hopefully either find her back behind those trees or we'll find some tracks where we can go find her you are literally looking in the eye of pain that you've caused and you're just not human if that doesn't slap you across the face so there is a a part of terror that reigns through me after I pull that trigger because I want to see that animal go down hard and fast. You got to put it out of its misery. Pride and joy and sorrow and I can't explain to you what goes through my mind. I cry. <laughs> I'm excited because I did it and sad because a life has ended and Every time you shoot an animal, for me, it's a little bit spiritual, and it's a little bit like you want to thank that animal for giving its life to you. You know, we don't go out trophy hunt. We actually go out to get meat to put in the freezer. You know, it's all about being grounded and connecting with your innermost self. And I feel like hunting brings out the primal energy in that same kind of way. It's very, very connecting to the world around you. It's really cool. When it all comes together and it's all working well, like there's nothing better than that. And then it just kind of gets quiet. Everything, everyone's quiet. The guns are quiet, you're quiet, the dogs are doing their thing. And I think that's the moment. You know, everybody's smiling and happy and everybody's just quiet because they're living in that moment. They're probably looking out at the, the field of nothingness and just being like, this is so great, <laughs> you know. So I think it's in the silence, in the silent times when you're, you're just kind of there. I think the draw was that these women of the past are like women today. Like they, they had adventures they wanted to go on. They felt the thrill of doing something new, um, being outside. They knew what it was like to be watching a deer that they had the best shot at and then deciding whether or not they were really going to take it or not. And you know, they, they felt all the same things that we feel today. We tracked her for a good three, four, maybe five hours. And she actually ended up coming all the way back down the mountain, across a creek, and then back straight up the other mountain. So unfortunately, we didn't harvest anything today. I don't think it's always gonna be this easy. I think I got very lucky, and I think that's part of it. But I think I needed this moment to let myself know that I can do it. And I might be good at it. Who knows? <laughs> Dog training is at my core, and so that's, I love it. <laughs> I, lo I love it. It's who I am. Hunting is such a spiritual activity for me out in the woods. And so it really, really hits home when it doesn't, when it's not successful. You know, hunt long enough and things like that happen. I have till December 7th if I wanted to keep hunting, but as far as I'm concerned, my cow tag is filled. That notched my tag, I'm not gonna keep hunting. 
I cannot represent everybody. I can only represent myself. And I'd love for people to be willing to have conversations and to learn more about being a hunter and what we do and why we do it. Funding for Outdoor Idaho is made possible by the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho, by the Friends of Idaho Public Television, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. To find more information about these shows, visit us at idahoptv.org.